good afternoon everybody and welcome uh, to this uh, session on newer concepts in the practice of pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus and uh, we have four speakers here today and uh, uh, i am the instructor dr kalpana narendran we are all from the uh, department of pediatric ophthalmology aravinde hospital coimbatore and uh, and what we're going to share with you today a little bit about the uh, common problem we see in children the pediatric cataracts and what we are doing differently especially with the use of the premium iols and uh, after me we all know that after the pandemic of covid we've seen an increased number of uh, refractive errors, errors in children especially myopia has become a big problem now and uh, the projection is uh, almost in 2050 50% of the population will be myopic so dr sandra is going to talk on the uh, you know treatment aspects what are the newer modalities in the management of myopia and uh, same thing with the use of gadgets uh, the uh, acute uh, esotropia has a problem and uh, dr uh, amrita will be speaking on that and dr sashikla will be dealing with uh, the aspects of uh, uh cvi and uh, what are the other uh, uh interventions and other strategies uh, with the uh, cortical visual impairment so uh, probably we will finish the session and then have the questions in the end so my first talk will be the uh, pediatric cataract and uh, what is the role of the multifocal and torics in children we all know that uh, you know the uh, the torics and multifocals and the edof lenses the so called premium iols have definitely uh, made a difference in the adult cataract surgery they've given a solution for the refractive uh, you know outcomes in the adult population but do they have a role in pediatric cataracts visual development being a challenge in children and also the other dilemmas like we have already these therapeutic dilemmas in children whether an iol should be placed at a younger age and then uh, what type of lens if at all we are going to place in children the biometry uh, what type of because we do not have a specific iol power calculation formula for children and we also do not have a customized iol for uh, the pediatric population and how are we going to manage the posterior capsule But the general consensus now is to uh, prefer uh, to put a monofocal foldable acrylic lens. The video is not playing. Can you play the video? Not this one. This one. This video. Okay. Fine. so the general consensus now when time tested we have seen that the monofocal uh, foldable acrylic lens is preferred by most and it is given good results uh, but then we have to prime the parent and the child that the child will need uh, glasses for near end distance uh, this is a surgery showing a video of how a uh, cataract is being done in a child and a three piece a uh, monofocal lens is preferred in children below the age of 5 years 5 or 6 years why so is because uh, when you operate on a very young child keeping the myopic shift in mind sometimes there is a possibility that the uh, child might later on go in for an iol exchange if there is a cross myopic shift so that is why a three piece lens because it's easy to exchange a three piece lens because adhesions are less when compared to the uh, single piece iol and what is the expectations of the parents uh, you know first of all when you tell them surgery they are very disappointed and then you tell them surgery with or without intraocular lens and glasses for lifelong they are very disappointed the first question they ask can i my child get rid of glasses at some point at least but uh, you know based on the age of the child you have to give them what is expected out of the surgery and you want to maintain good binocular single vision and stereo acuity and uh, what is the advantage or what is the you know debate between uh, the monofocal lenses and the premium iols the present era we are already having this issue like i already mentioned how early to implant an iol in a child the different school of thoughts some people say unilateral cataract at 2 weeks or 3 weeks of uh, age bilateral usually after 6 weeks of uh, presentation or the age i would rather say 
and the lot of advances in technology. So what type of lens can be used in these children? And what is the role of multifocal lenses, which I'm going to talk about shortly? And the role of refractive surgeries to fix the residual refractive error. For why do we really have to talk about multifocals in children? Because we all know that in adults, already the presbyopia is set in, so you're, there's not much of loss of accommodation. Whereas in children, when you intervene at a very young age, there is, uh, you know, the G G children lose accommodation. So this can sometimes lead to abnormal development of binocular vision. And uh, multifocal lenses in children, one is definitely the age at which you're going to intervene. So older children will be the ideal candidates and you need precise biometric measurements and precise IL power calculations and always aim at emetropia or slight residual hyperopia, you know, which can range from 0.25 to 0.5 diopters. And uh, again, IL power selection, younger the patient, more difficult. That's why I said the age group usually is above the age of 10 or 11 years of age. And, and also based on your biometry, if it's on the myopic side, I would probably uh, defer to put a multifocal lens because sometimes there might be a gross myopic shift. And uh, finally, you have to calculate for the refraction in adulthood. So this is just a multifocal uh, you know, lens being implanted in a 12-year-old boy. I'm using the Varion guided system for the centration of the capsorexis. And we very well saw it was an intumescent lens. So I did a small rexis, removed part of the cortex. I'm doing a secondary rexis and do a thorough cortical cleanup, especially in a patient with a multifocal lens. Do not have any financial interest, but this was a panoptix lens from the Alcon. So once you place the lens in the bag, and invariably these children will go for a posterior capsular fibrosis. A good primary posterior capsulotomy is should be done, but the anterior vitrectomy can be deferred because the older child usually do not go in for a for pacification of the anterior vitreous space. And the merits, definitely there's a rapid visual rehabilitation for near, intermediate and distance. There is improved chance of binocularity in these children. And there is also a reduced risk of uh, amblyopia accumulative blur. And uh, then the children do not have to wear bifocals. And uh, they also uh, have a proper focus of the image. And the, the demerits, like, uh, you know, one is the age, IOL prediction calculability is very difficult. You cannot predict the uh, thing. And then very, very important is you need the child's cooperation because you have to have a precise biometry and you have to have a good support of an optometrist to get those values. And uh, in very young children, the reflective stability is again not predictable. And uh, visual development of the pediatric eye, because of the non-optimum multifocality, sometimes can cause abnormality in the visual development because children do not usually complain. And again, centration issues because some children can develop more inflammation, so PC fibrosis, anterior phimosis, decentration of the bag. So all that can cause centration problems. Again, the outcome when you compare between adults and children, usually adults have complaints related to glare and halos and there is loss of contrast sensitivity. Whereas in children, usually they do not complain. They withhold or fail to come out with the symptoms. And there might be a loss of intermediate vision and contrast sensitivity. Sometimes we exaggerate the amblyopia. And uh, this visual nuisance, what is being coming out as complaints with the adults are not usually you know, made by the children, but then it can sometimes disrupt or make changes in the visual development. And uh, other challenges surgically, you know, you have to be very careful. You need a proper incision. You need a proper bag to place a multifocal lens. So as we all know, as pediatric cataract surgeons, it's not very easy like in adults. So there will be a push. There will be increased pressure, all that you have to keep in mind. So that is one uh, thing you have to keep in mind. The other challenges postoperatively, even excellent surgery, inflammation sometimes can cause posterior sinicae, like PC opacification. This picture here showing a... Uh, my, you know, air capsulotomy being done in spite of the, uh, you know, PC caps, posterior rex is done, there was opacification. So all that should be kept in mind. And in rare cases, you may have to go in for a uh, IOL explantation exchange. But one thing to keep in mind is if you do a proper selection of IOL, this will not happen 90% of the times. And just to reinsure, and uh, this is just some of the studies uh, which were done as early as 2001, 
they have done 35 eyes, 26 patients, and they said that at least 10 of these eyes required a secondary surgery. And this is just to, you know, kind of giving you some evidence that it has been done from 2001, but now, uh, you know, it is recommended that multifocal lenses can be a choice in older children. And again, this is another study, 2010, Christabel et al., they did this study, five children. The number of uh, children were very less, and the minimum follow-up was almost about 21 mo months. And uh, they are also saying that long-term results have been done. And we at Aravind Coimbatore have done around 10 patients so far, and uh, they are fairly doing well. Most of them are doing well. We do not have a long term. We have only a follow-up of up to about three years. And uh, so far, the results have been uh, good. So to conclude, definitely multivocals can be an option in older children. Always keep in mind the, you know, relative shift. And also, there is a chance of degradation of amblyopia due to loss of contrast sensitivity. And, and even today, the hydrophobic monofocal acrylic lenses are the choice of lens. But do keep in mind, these are also options. But we do not have long-term results. But it can be kept in mind for older children. So coming to toric eyeballs in children, again, we all know that uh, uh, at birth, children are usually having an against rule astigmatism. And then with growing age, they became with the rule. And later on, as they get older, they, became, they usually become against the rule astigmatism. And toric I will usually about 1.5 diopters definitely have a you know have a role in uh, dealing with children with the uh, cataracts, gives them a better unaided uh, visual acuity for distance, and also reduces the risk of amblyopia. So, like I already mentioned, usually about 1.5 diopters about the age of 10 years, I would say, but all exclude children with other pathology, other fundus pathology or subluxation or keratoconus. So you need to do all the investigations. You have a corneal topography and uh, measure the corneal thickness, roll out keratoconus. And postoperatively, the uh, refraction keratometry should be checked at every visit. Again, the toric marking should be done before the induction of anesthesia, making the child sitting up position using a topical um, anesthetic drops. And this is a video of a toric eye oil being implanted. Again, the Varian guided system is used and the toric marking is done. So this was a 11 year old boy with the 2.5 cylinder. So all these premium lenses is very important to have a adequate sized centered rexus. So uh, that's very important to keep in mind. So do a thorough cortical cleanup. Just one moment. And uh, the toric eye oil is implanted. The axis is 92. So well centered lens in the bag. And uh, uh, this is preferable if you're comfortable and if you think you can do a primary posterior excess, it can be done. If not, you can leave it alone the child. Later on, if there's a PC fibrosis, we can always go for a yeah, capsulotomy. And the wound is always closed with a 10-0 vital suture. And this child also had a vitreous disturbance, so vitrectomy was also done. You can see postoperatively, it's a well-aligned lens with a good uh, clear visual axis. So, um, uh, to conclude, definitely the, uh, the premium IOLs are a choice. And regarding need off lenses, I did not mention. I think I was going through literature. It is also coming into use in the pediatric cataracts, but I do not have much of experience on that. But we just started doing it. Anyways, thank you. So, I think I call upon the next speaker, uh, Dr. Sandra, who has done a lot of work in uh, myopia. And we also have set up a myopia clinic in, uh, in the Aravinda Hospital, Coimbatore, because we've seen the increase in number of cases. So we will share our experience in what's happening in the myopia clinic. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, ma'am, for the kind invitation. So um, I'll be talking about uh, two of the most current topics in uh, pediatric ophthalmology nowadays, uh, being uh, myopia and amblyopia management. So this slide shows uh, just a sneak peek of the myopia, myopia predictions between uh, 2090 and uh, 2022. Um, you can see that across the year, 
we have been seeing a more increase in the number of new myopia cases, that is the uh, red pointer. And also, if you look at the time trends on the prevalence of myopia in India, it goes, uh, this model is for 2050. And you can see that it increases to around 31% in 2010, 40% in 2040, and for around 50% uh, in 2050. And uh, this can be brought down to around 32% with myopia interventions. And that is a very big uh, thing. So is it controlled only by genetics? So a lot of genetic factors are there in the uh, implicated in myopia. And also we know about the parental association with a higher risk of myopia, two times if one parent is myopic and around five times if both the parents are myopic. But the dramatic increase in myopia prevalence over the last 50 years cannot be explained only by genetic factors. So uh, environmental and behavior uh, factors are definitely there. So in the past, our human ancestors were more looking at distance, but only, only in the last 100 years, they have started more of uh, looking at the near, and this has led to the dramatic increase in myopia. So increased uh, time spent outdoors can prevent or delay the onset of myopia by around 30%. And definitely, that goes to say that there should be less time spent on smartphones, near digital devices, and near tasks as well. And the viewing distance should always be less than uh, more than 20 centimeters. So the smartphones and tablets, if we held it very close to the face, that can result in progression of myopia. And always we have to remember that we have to follow the 2020 rule when we are using the gadgets. So with these in mind, a lot of research has been on underway <coughs> in myopia over the last uh, few years. And this is the consensus statement which has been given by the WCPOS, uh, which most of the pediatric ophthalmologists will be having in hand. And it gives forth the behavior interventions, optical treatment, and the pharmacological interventions which, are, um, which have been proven to have an effect on myopia control. And what does not work also has been uh, elucidated. And one of it is the blue light blocking glasses, which really does not have much effect. So myopia is multifactorial. The main uh, factors being age, ethnicity, gender, and parental myopia. And there are several minor factors, which include circadian rhythm, ocular factors, education, near work, time spent outdoors, uh, rural, urban, etc. Another uh, thing that we keep hearing nowadays very often is the peripheral refraction. So what is this peripheral refraction and peripheral hyperopic defocus? So this is a refraction that we do like offset from the center by 20 degrees nasal and 30 degrees temporal. And why is this so important? Because visual signals from the fovea are not essential for ocular growth as has been proven by studies by ablating the fovea. So how do we measure the peripheral refraction? This is by an open field auto refractometer uh, which has been developed by certain companies, but it's quite expensive, around 8 to 10 lakhs. So the same thing can be done with the help of this. this is a new instrument which has been developed by the LV Prasad group, which is called as a PAR, that can be fitted onto the uh, retinoscope uh, and uh, you can easily do the peripheral refraction as well. So these are the patterns of peripheral refraction that we see. In emetropes, it is said that they have a weak relative peripheral uh, myopia where uh, and hyperopes also have a relative peripheral myopia that is in the center the focus is towards the uh, behind the retina whereas in the periphery the hyperopic uh, eye the focus is in front of the retina but look what is happening in the myopic eye in the myopic eye the center is focusing in front of the retina whereas in periphery because of the shape of the eyeball the focus is going behind the retina so myopic people some of them have this relative peripheral hyperopia so when you are putting them on a single vision uh, glasses, that is your uh, diverging glasses, the relative peripheral hypopia is worsened. So whenever that happens, that results in progression. So the fact to remember is that whenever there is a relative peripheral um, hyperopia in such eyes, if we put them on single vision glasses, the myopia will continue to progress at a rate faster than what is expected. So then how can we control this is with the help of lenses which can create a myopic defocus. So these lenses, currently available ones which are based on this kind of technology are the HALT lenses and the DIMS lenses. The uh, lenses based on the DIMS technology um, as uh, called as the MyoSmart lenses. 
they have a central 9 millimeter clear zone and they have a peripheral honeycomb pattern. So that creates the peripheral myopic defocus and um, in theory it helps to reduce the progression of myopia. Similarly, the SLR stellar lenses also are based upon the Hall technology and they create a volume of defocus in front of the retina and helps to uh, retard the myo uh, progression of myopia. So these are the studies of the, uh, the DIMS lenses uh, of the Hoya group which have uh, a 7 year study and uh, they uh, said in that study that the progression of myopia is only around minus 0.15 diopters per year or about 0.1 millimeters per year on an average and the treatment has been sustained over the 6 year period. On comparison of the DIMS and the HALT lenses, both are of polycarbonate material and uh, um, so when we uh, prescribe these lenses, we should also know when they are working. So what is the target progression? The target progression cannot be the same for all age groups. In the age group less than 9 years, the target should be less than 0.5 uh, diopters per year or an actual length of less than 0.3 millimeters per year. So whatever interventions you are following, if this is being achieved, then that means that your treatment is working. Similarly, over the age of 9 years, the target myopia progression should be less than 0.3 diopters per year and the actual length change being less than 0.15 uh, millimeter per year. So coming to atropine in myopia, it slows progression by about 50 to 60 percent is uh, what all the studies uh, wise and with our own experience. Effect is better in the second year than the first. And uh, as of now, currently in India, we are getting only the 0.01 uh, uh, the percentage, but very soon probably the 0 0.05 will also be available. But the thing to remember about the higher percentage is that the risk of rebound is always there when the, uh, so the guidelines for stopping will be more difficult, the more higher the percentage of atropine that you are using. And the sustained effect on five-year follow-up uh, is also there. But 20 to 30 percent of people need higher doses for myopia control and also 10 percent of the children will be non-responders even to high dose atropine. So this is the eye atom study which has been done um, uh, by in three centers, RP center, Nara Netralia and Shankar Netralia which was a multicentric uh, double-blinded uh, study to uh, evaluate the efficacy of 0.01 percent atropine in reducing myopia progression in Indian children because most of the previous studies are from Singapore and they proved that uh, the difference in spherical equivalent was about minus 0.16 in the atropine group and minus 0.35 diopters in the uh, placebo group and this was statistically uh, you know, significant. So this proves that it works well in Indian eyes as well. So this is the impact myopia management guidelines as given by LVP. So we have to first advise, identify the true actual myopia, it's very important. So uh, for all these interventions, we should not choose a, a pathological myopia or a syndromic myopia or even uh, ROP treated myopia, it does not work in those conditions. We have to map the risk factors, pick out the progressive myopes, advise appropriate myopia control strategy and then uh, counsel combine and monitor regularly. So with this, uh, this in mind, the myopia clinic will do the risk assessment, clinical evaluation and give a customized uh, treatment plan and uh, we should include only simple myopes, age group 6 to 14 with a stable cylinder. If there is any doubt about the cylinder, we always have to do a topography and confirm. Key points in history will be the age, the parental myopia because age means once the myopia starts at around uh, 6 years of age, it is very different from starting myopia at the age of 11 or 12. Near work, outdoor time, prior progression and prior treatment and also educating staff and the parents are very important to discuss the various treatment options available. So evaluation will include dynamic refraction including duochrome, a BV analysis, MEM uh, for accommodation, <coughs> non-contact axial length, keratometry, cyclorefraction and interact ophthalmoscopy. Rule of axial length is paramount. It's the most important uh, metric to monitor which should be documented for all the kids because the repeatability of refractive error measurement only with subjective refraction can be around plus minus 0.5 adopters even between uh, people. But for eye length measurement, the repeat repeatability is between 10 to 50 micrometers. So definitely it's much more uh, effective indicator than just relying on the refractive error alone. 
and these are the non contact biometric various types are there your uh, size IL master or the uh, the uh, my uh, the hoya the lens star machines uh, they also help to uh, and these lens star myopia machines can even give a progression chart based on which we can um, choose the interventions which will be appropriate for the child Cycloplegic refraction with full cycloplegia is uh, important because we should not over minus the children. The correct focus on the frames, fit and centration is equally important. So this is our study with the myo uh, smart glasses whom which we have around uh, 9 months follow up till now. Prescribed 71 glasses out of which 30, percent, uh, 30 patients have come for 6 months follow up. And before we gave them on the myosmart glasses, 23 were progressive myops. 7 of them we started because of a very strong family history and young age. So out of these, um, none of the ch play, uh, children require a change of glasses so far. But the actual length is more than expected rate in around 7 of them. So 5 of them we have added a combination of low dose atropine. And marginally reduction in angiogenic length is seen in around 9 patients. So achieving compliance with the parents is very important. The most important thing to confirm whatever you do, the environmental and the behavior modifications are paramount. Unless they achieve that, the interventions will not work. So coming to amblopia, the first step will be to correct refraction, the last prescription, rule out organic causes. The traditional therapy was always the gold standard, but the pitfalls can be poor adherence. Decreased compliance with increasing age, psychosocial impact of patch, light sensitivity with atropine and it does not really achieve true equalization because it does not address suppression and it does not encourage simultaneous perception. And amblopia is not only a visual acuity loss because patching can target only the visual acuity improvement, it cannot target the depth perception, binocular vision and eye teaming. And there are a lot of other difficulties along with uh, visual acuity loss and amblopia including inability to fuse at near, uh, double vision, blurry vision, headache, poor tracking, poor processing. And so the new newer concepts would include binocular vision training where we encourage both eyes to work as a team with a goal to break suppression, improve reading ability, better academic performance and better sports performance. So the concepts based on these are the perceptual uh, learning and the dichoptic training. So just to, for a very short summary, the um, binocular therapy using dichoptic stimuli will present two stimuli to either eye with a difference in contrast, the contrast being reduced in the normal eye. And as the visual activity improves, the contrast will be gradually increased. So this Amblego is based on this principle where the patient has to play games for around 30 to 40 minutes for at least 5 times a week and initially the improvement can be seen in around the first 2 weeks and the sustained improvement around 6 to 8 weeks. So you can target patients even at the age of 5 years with foveal fixation, no tropia, full refractive correction, if there is high myopia you give a contact lens, there should not be microtropia or eccentric fixation. So in our experience, all the green are the patients where we have seen at least a two logmar line improvement, the blue where we have one logmar line improvement and the red where we did not have any improvement. They are a minority. So out, uh, till now we have completed 21 patients out of which 13 are an ISO envelopes, 8 have improvement of two lines, one, uh, three, uh, one logmar line and two no BCV improvement in an ISO envelope. Ametrope similarly, uh, most of them have had two log bar line improvement, but strabismic, uh, there are two patients who did not have BCVA improvement, but 19 out of 21 have improvement in BSV and 17 out of 21 have improvement in stereopsis. And perceptual learning is also based on similar principles with the Gabor patches. We are uh, just started with this now uh, and we had good result in two patients with nystagmus. So thank you. of uh, myopia, you know, only as uh, practicing pediatric ophthalmologists, we know the magnitude of myopia we see in children because pre-COVID was around, uh, you know, 20, 21 percent. Now post-COVID, it's almost 30 percent and the projections are there. And uh, so it's very, I mean, one thing is we try all these uh, different lenses, but most importantly, lifestyle changes. That is what is very important, these children to avoid gadgets as much as they can do and also increase the outdoor, uh, you know, activity time more. Uh, so that is what is going to make a difference in these children. And uh, the next speaker will be Dr. Amrita. So, um, 
she'll be talking on acute esotropias, management strategies. Again, this is a problem which we see more after the uh, the COVID and probably because of the increased usage of uh, gadgets. What do you know? Thank you, ma'am. A good afternoon, one and all, who have gathered here. So at this outset, I would like to thank AIOC and my mentors for this opportunity. So I'll be talking about acute onset esotropia management strategies. So I think uh, as trebismologists, all of you would have seen a, a recent increase in the incidence of this esotropia, especially post COVID era, which has uh, gained a lot of importance. And there's a lot of changes happening in the, the management strategies of this. So the next uh, 10 to 15 minutes, I'll be talking about the uh, management strategies of acute onset esotropias. So if we take, a, take all the causes which, can, which the patient can present with acute ETs, the common ones are the acute acquired committent esotropia, which I'll be addressing as AS now onwards. And the other causes are six nerve palsy, divergence palsy, age-related distance esotropia, accommodative esotropia, ocular myasthenia, and uh, decompensated monofixation syndrome. So I'll be stressing more on AS in this topic. So when do we call a patient having a ACE? So any patient presenting with acute onset of esotropia, which has a relatively large angle, there is no near distance disparity, neither there is any incompetence, who present with diplopia and with a minimal refractive error, we can classify them as having acute acquired competent esotropias. So earlier in literature, if you see all this ACE has been classified basically into three groups, that is SWAN, uh, type one, that is SWAN, basically caused by prolonged occlusion. Type two is uh, Franceschetti type, which is basically associated with mild uh, hypermetropias, and type three, which is Bielschkowski's, which is associated with uh, mild to moderate myopias. But of late, we cannot uh, uh, classify the patients who are presenting with AS into these three groups, because we have a lot of patients presenting with uh, varied etiologies, which cannot completely fit into these groups. So in order to decode these causes for this ACE, uh, so we can take into consideration these uh, causes. So uh, probably patient might be having a pre-existing phoria, which uh, over time gets decompensated, resulting in an acute esotropia. So with uh, post-COVID era, you see a lot of gadget usage, excessive near work, which can in turn increase the medial rectus tone, in turn leading on to acute onset of esotropias. Again, functional accommodative spasm may be related to stress or uh, uh, various uh, uh, neurological factors. So the functional accommodative spasm is also a cause. Last but not the least is the neurological uh, causes, which is of more concern in these cases, because although the ACE, uh, in, if we see the incidence of ACE, the number of neurological causes are very less, but we can't afford to miss these patients. So uh, this, uh, these are the neurological causes for ACE. The, the common ones are tumors of the brainstem. So we know that brainstem uh, has a center for uh, divergence. So divergence palsy can in turn lead to acute esotropias. Tumors of cerebellum can cause excessive convergence, which in turn can lead to uh, esotropias. Other than that, Arnold Chiali malformations and idiopathic intracranial in hypertension can lead on to acute onset of esotropia. So this slide shows the importance of neuroimaging in all cases presenting with acute esotropias. So coming to evaluation, so take a, a brief history, uh, look for any uh, history of excess gadget usage, excess of near work, recent stress, any recent illness in the history. So again, documenting the duration of onset of ET is important because the management strategy depends on the duration of onset of symptoms. Do a thorough cycloplegic refraction in order to pick up any hypermetropias or myopia associated with the ET. Uh, uh, a complete uh, PCT is important. Do a uh, deviation uh, measurement for distance as well as near look for the pattern because uh, uh, the importance of pattern i'll be telling in the subsequent slides do a nine gaze pct look for any incompetence and uh, check for the motility uh, identify if there is any nystagmus which can uh, point towards any neurological cause and document the stereopsis and fusion and uh, definitely a thorough neurological examination is also important so coming to management of ACE, uh, three things 
One is the prism, uh, although prism may not be useful in most of the cases because most of the A's will have a moderate to large angle ETs where the prisms may not work. So prisms can be given if the isotropia is like 10 to 12 prisms. So uh, uh, there are two ways of managing. One is use of botulinum toxin which has actually re revolutionized the management of uh, this acute ETs. Uh, provided the patient presents at an early uh, early time or if in case of late presentation surgery will be the management so in order to share uh, our experience with uh, botox i would like to thank my mentor dr sandra ma'am for sharing this presentation so we conducted a study in uh, arvind the uh, eye hospital 47 children who underwent this uh, botulinum toxin therapy are included in the study so most of them were in the age group of 6 to 15 years, about 26 uh, children were within uh, six, 6 to 15 uh, years of age group, 12 were less than 5 years of age group and 9 were about uh, 16 years. So gender disparity like uh, males uh, was around 64% uh, and female 36%. There was no significant uh, systemic illness or any uh, significant history. 42 of them didn't have any significant uh, previous history. One ha three had fever, uh, one had uh, GBS syndrome, and one had a history of RTA three months prior. 16 of the children were wear wearing glasses at the time of presentation, and 31 didn't have any glasses. So the use of gadget, the duration of time was quite significant. It was around four, uh, four hours per day from a range of 1 to 11 hours. So if we see the angle, uh, around 47 of them had a variable angle. Again, uh, uh, it becomes difficult to decide on surgery in these children when the angle is variable because many of the ACE patients during the time of presentation, they'll have a variable angle. 53% had, 53 of them had a, a stable angle and 79% of them presented with diplopia at the time of presentation and 21% did not have diplopia. So uh, I think the visual acuity and the spherical uh, error was not very significant. If we see the um, uh, PCT pre-injection, uh, pre it was uh, quite uh, high. It was like around at the range uh, of uh, 42 prism diopters, ranging from 20 to 65 prism diopters. So duration of onset, uh, 24 of the children had uh, an uh, onset uh, less than one month. Uh, around 12 to uh, 13 to 14 of them had uh, a duration of one to four months and uh, around uh, seven of them had uh, more than five months of onset. So to show the procedure, uh, it was uh, the dosage was decided on the deviation from three to six units of uh, botulinum toxin was injected into the medial rectus. Uh, most, all the cases underwent only unilateral uh, injection. It was given transconjunctively, depending on the age, it was either topical or under short general anesthesia. So using a superior rectus forceps, the muscle was held. So using an insulin syringe, the botulinum toxin, the required dosage is uh, taken, injected until the hub, make sure the, uh, the needle is completely in the muscle belly. Once the position is secured, inject the drug and slowly retract the needle. Make sure there is no extravasation of the drug. So coming to the results, uh, so here the success rate uh, in the left left hand side, what uh, whatever is shown is the alignment. So anything uh, where the deviation was less than eight prism diopters was taken as success. Around 60% of them had uh, successful alignment post injection. And uh, uh, around 20% uh, of them had uh, a failure, that is more than eight prisms of whether they had diplopia or not, These are, those people were considered as fail failure. And uh, repeat injection was given in 15% of them. So if we take the diplopia uh, baseline, 37 of them had diplopia at the time of presentation and 10 did not have diplopia. So if you see uh, by, uh, by the end of one month, 82% of them did not have diplopia. And by, uh, if we follow over six months, 92% of them uh, did not have diplopia. Again, uh, if we take the binocular uh, single vision, so by end of three months, uh, there was a success rate of uh, 79, nearly 80% of them regained their BSV, 4% uh, of them Four of them had uh, suppression. 
So average time of fall off of these patients was around nine months. So if we analyze the results, we can see that those children who were less than five years had a more success rate with this botulinum toxin. Around 90% of them had successful alignment and regained BSV. As the age of the child increases, the success rate falls down. So this shows probably because the younger child has more plasticity, neuroplasticity, they could align well post injection. So the success rate was more in younger children. And also uh, the, uh, the patients who presented with diplopia at the time of uh, uh, before the injection, they had a good uh, success rate compared to those presented with suppression. So uh, identifying the right patient uh, who is having, uh, uh, who present within like one month uh, of the onset of uh, uh, squint along with diplopia, the success rate was more. So to conclude, uh, around 66% of our patients, they got fully aligned with normal BSV after single injection of botulinum toxin and they continued to have this alignment even after one year of follow-up. So botulinum toxin is a less uh, invasive as we are not disturbing any anatomy. It gives a faster recovery and rehabilitation. It's a very good option for variable angle where we cannot decide on the amount uh, of surgery. Uh, definitely it is cost effective as compared to surgery. And it can be given as an option for the, those patients who are presenting early. And if not successful, we can always take up for surgery at a later date. So moving on to surgery, if we are planning for surgery mostly, we can we need not wait like any other uh, uh, palsies. We don't have to wait for six months. We can always plan an earlier surgery once we get a stable deviation. So because early surgery helps to restore the binocularity and stereopsis. If, it, if the angle is moderate, you can always plan for a bimedial recession. In case of larger angles, we can plan for a unilateral recess, resect procedures. A small uh, point about six nerve palsies. Some of the mild six nerve paresis, the, the paresis part recovers, only the esotropia part remains. This can present as an acute esotropia, which is committent. So look for a presence of a pattern. Presence of a V pattern in these cases suggests a recovered LR paresis. So, so to conclude my talk, so never miss to image any case of this acute esotropias. Definitely botulinum toxin is a promising uh, uh, option. And think of an early treatment, either botulinum toxin or surgery. If it is done at an earlier uh, time, it can give us successful results. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Amrita, uh, for uh, coming up. So, uh, uh, currently, we are giving uh, Botox, as she said, whenever the patient uh, presents very early who has clearly diplopia and who has not yet gone for suppression and uh, within the uh, one month or two months. So if that is the case, then that can be a first line of therapy. And uh, when patients present little late over three months or we have a doubt that they have gone for suppression, then we advise uh, surgery. And we are having our own 60% success with a single injection. So now uh, we invite uh, Dr. Sashi Kila, who will be talking about yet another very important topic and Dr. Suma is going to present the entire uh, session uh, just coming up next on CVI, Early Intervention Strategies. Over to you, Dr. Sashi Kila. Yeah, good afternoon to all. I thank the organizing uh, committee for giving me this opportunity. So I'll be talking on Early Intervention Strategies. So vision is a product of the complex system in which eyes are a part. 40% of the brain is involved in the visual function. So CVI is nothing but it's a form of neurological visual impairment that is caused by dysfunction of the brain rather than a disorder of the ocular system. So anything that is posterior to the lateral geniculate, retrogeniculate visual pathway results in CVI and pregeniculate we term it as an ocular visual impairment. Briefly uh, I'll be talking about the cortical visual impairment because the next session is going to be in detail before going into the early interventions. So recently uh, CVI has been the most common cause of visual impairment in children. Mostly it is left uh, unobserved and under, under detected. In the developing countries recently there's be because of better management of the avoidable cause, improved diagnosis and reporting and increased survival of premature infants, we are seeing the incidence to be rising. So the most common cause of all these lists is uh, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy followed by neonatal hypoglycemia. So these result in uh, periventricular leukomalacia. The other reasons are epilepsy, focal brain lesions, injury, infections, uh, malformations, metabolic and genetic causes. So 
based on the severity, that is the impact on the visual function, CVI is divided into severe, moderate and mild. So spectrum wise, those children who have profound visual impairment are classified and grouped as low functioning CVI and those with normal and near normal visual acuity who are the group most often missed who have a cognitive visual dysfunction are graded as high functioning CVI. How the brain sees, just in a brief, whatever the visual impulses that are received from the brain are passed on to the occipital lobe. From there, via the dorsal stream, it, the informations are shared to the posterior parietal lobe, which is involved in 3D uh, vision function, visual guided movements, and via the ventral stream shared to the temporal lobe, which is responsible for recognition of face, object, and roots. So if there is an occipital lobe injury that results in poor vision, color, and the fields are affected, if there is a dorsal stream damage, it leads to optic ataxia, apraxia of gaze, simultagnesia, and lower visual field defects. If there is damage to the temporal lobe and the ventral uh, stream damage leads to visual agnosia and difficulty in seeing people and difficulty in recognizing roots. Middle temporal lobe damage results in difficulty in seeing fast moving objects and intact middle temporal lobe with occipital lobe damage results in blind sight. So, the workup starts with a detailed history followed by refraction, a proper uh, uh, examination of the accommodation of the child, anterior posterior segment evaluation and the orthoptic evaluation. So history, you ask series of questions to actually trigger the evidence of vision. If there is evidence of vision, then you ask the further questions to the parents to know more about the details of vision. If in the history you are getting answers of negativity that there is no or limited vision, go ahead to the parents further questioning about any possibility of vision such as the child moving the uh, mouth towards the side of the spoon when it is brought or occasional reflex smiling or tendency of light staring. So the intervention strategies, most often after a clinical evaluation, the intervention strategies for children would emerge from the clinical evaluation that is being made. So careful assessment is required. The assessment has to be in all the visual uh, uh, dimension of the aspects such as visual discrimination, spheres, visual field, contrast, color, circuits, visual latency and visual attention. There are series of tests which is in the armamentary room CVI, but one has to keep in mind that it is not possible to administer all the uh, tests for a child in the first consultation. Most commonly, they undergo a preferential looking test, puppet uh, face, mirror test, visual field and color test, so as to know what the grade of the vision for the child is. So this here, uh, we, we have a child who is undergoing functional uh, vision assessment using a hiding Heidi low contrast test and a Leah paddle. It is quite challenging for uh, the uh, examiner and also for the parent to make them sit for the examination. So it gives us an idea. So where the child fix it, sometime momentarily only you'll be getting a clue about the grade of the vision for the child. This is a Leah mailbox test uh, to see for uh, visual uh, spatial orientation for this child. Here you can see that the child is keenly watching and able to fix it, but his coordination spatial orientation is less. You can use it for direction wise also. It can be left uh, held, held in the horizontal and vertical position. So after the clinical evaluation, many times many children with CVI may show little or no useful vision, but developing visual consciousness and appreciation of visual information are the critical things to, and, and first step, step for intervention. One has to keep in mind that each child with CVI is unique and no one plan fits all. So the first thing to be tried is try glasses. Glasses are must. So uh, there's a common notion that children with CVI do not accept glasses and uh, it's very difficult to prescribe glasses for them. But even if the refraction is going to be normal, prescribing a low plus such as plus two to a plus three or plus five will help them to perform the interventions in a better way. So per perform a cycloplegic refraction and a mem refraction and wherever possible, try to give them glasses. The general principles for intervention, when once a methodology of intervention is planned for the child, prepare the child for that intervention. Posture is more important, especially in children with cerebral palsy, having a positioning chair to keep the child or else most of the time you'll be spending in positioning the child. Priming the child for the quality of object is also important using a radio language, one word at a time, not to use jargons of word, not to use sentences, to be very clear what we are trying to express to the child. Always insist on looking behavior. Communication is very important to keep the child always into the spectrum of uh, training, uh, never to leave a child uh, in a cradle unattended, always it is better to continuously interact with them uh, as part of the intervention. Environmental modification like setting up a sensory tent or a place where the child will be much more calm to uh, receive the interventions. 
So some suggestions are start with a simple object that is available at home, what they have and what the child is familiar. It can be just five to 10 minutes when they start, it can be creative. Uh, it uh, should be something that awakes the child's visual curiosity. You can use variety of object. Here the child is preferring a gaze. So always start the intervention from the gaze the child is preferring. And uh, multisensory learning is the other aspect. Whenever the brain uh, loses uh, function in one sense, it tries to uh, improve with the other sense. There is a strong link between the vision and touch. So this is a vision, this is a light box with a uh, moving uh, target that is given to the child. So one should keep in mind that strategies must be consistent with the child's and family's daily routine. It should not be something very different that they have to adopt specifically. So early intervention for phase one, you can use an illuminated toy, you can use bright colored toys in a dark room using tactile stimulation. Uh, in phase two, sibling play. Sibling play has a very big role. Uh, mirror activities, daily activities can be converted into therapy. Uh, when, in, in sibling play, basically it takes off the stress from the parents when uh, the siblings are being involved. The whole family should take up responsibility for the intervention for the child's aspect. For high functioning CY, we can uh, use uh, different puzzles, games, shapes and color matching. This is a sensory tent. Parents can do it at home. They can have a table, they can have a sheet uh, put over the table and convert it into a sensory tent. It basically uh, creates an environment of clutter free, makes them more uh, uh, um, comfortable with the uh, pro care, uh, uh, caregiver and uh, helps them to comply better. You can always display it to the parents, but always make sure that you convey it clearly to them that should not create a clutter. This is just an idea for them to have what all uh, items they can have. The most important thing is uh, not only the vision therapist, there should be a good, good communication between the OT, uh, physiotherapist, speech therapist and the special educator. They should all be in one line so that the therapy goes for a long time and be successful for the child. So our role uh, as the clinician should be to empower the parents for the strategies of their own. You can administer the CVI questionnaire so as to know which track the child is on. Questioning the parents and having a feedback will know where the parents are interested and where they are lacking behind because parents are the most important people who can optimally teach and communicate with their children. Few cases I want to share. This is a child at two, brought at two years of age, full term <coughs> normal delivery. Child had seizures at one month of age. MRI brain was normal. And uh, on doing a Leah paddle, she was responding to one cycles. And uh, we started uh, uh, intervention for her. Her color vision uh, we had uh, tested she was responding slightly more to the yellow intensity compared to the red. Then slowly her interventions at home were started. Parents were able to comply. So a familiar object that was used at home, which she often has that was given. And uh, you should give time for the child to observe. There should be a good distance. The positioning of the child is to be maintained always. Good illumination should be there. You should avoid uh, any clutters. So here the mother is uh, trying to give a glittery object. Uh, usage of glasses, complying to that. Sometimes it is difficult to make them uh, uh, sit for a longer duration, so you can give gaps for them in between their uh, interventions. <coughs> this is a three-year-old child who was brought to us. She had a neonatal uh, sepsis and delayed milestones. Uh, she was only responding to high contrast. She had a progressive encephalopathy. Her Leah grating was only 0 0.25 cycles. So the parents understood the degree of uh, visual acuity that she had and was able to uh, use things that were at home, they were able to be creative. So sometimes uh, in such children, it is a little bit of frustration from the parent side when they show a slower improvement, but as clinician, we should be able to encourage them for a continuous uh, uh, therapy. This, uh, this child was brought at two years of age uh, with a respiratory distress. His MRI showed a PVL changes, alternative exotropia. Fundus showed a disc pallor. Uh, parents were able to uh, initiate uh, therapy at home. He had uh, fixing and following when he came. And slowly with therapy, he, with the objects that were at home and parents were quite uh, encouraging also. So here he has spatial uh, orientation and uh, difficulty. Slowly that uh, improved. Mirror play also has a very good uh, role because they are able to see themselves, uh, feel about the parts, interact very well and uh, be more expressive. This is the case for a uh, six-year-old boy who had uh, neonatal hypoglycemia, disc pallor. We prescribed hypermetropic glasses. His main problem was spatial uh, relation and uh, contrast. He was a high functioning CVI child. Slowly, uh, simple tips were given at home. He was able to comply. Parents were more uh, encouraging. He started reading and uh, writing. So here you can see that the parents are using a darker background, dark colored pencils. And um, uh, now his uh, skills for reading, writing is slowly improving. This is a case uh, five. Again, this child is also a uh, high, fu high functioning uh, CVI child 
who had uh, febrile seizures, disc pallor, with the hypermetropic glasses, he was able to perform his uh, reading skills, writing. And uh, here the uh, uh, trainer, she's using a dark background with the text. So all these materials are brought by the parents. They, are, they become more creative and more involved as we uh, start giving them the right directions. So when we looked into literature, what the literature stands for, the uh, uh, researches that go into CVI, uh, uh, this is published in 2023, 2023. So only there are 23 articles that were included in the study and uh, most of the research articles that look into intervention for CVI is still in its infancy and a lower level of evidence is there and most of the studies have a smaller size. So that uh, explains to us. So to take home, uh, uh, take home points for my conclusion, uh, each child with CVI is unique. Intervention strategies should be tailored based on the clinical evaluation. The caretaker must ensure that child's routines are uh, well uh, filled with information, thoughtful and uh, uh, proper interventions are required and interdisciplinary uh, measures will help us to give a ex successful therapy for these children. Thank you so much for your uh, kind listening. Thank you, uh, Madam, for this opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys.